Hi, hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us during the Lithum Partners Spring 2022 Investor Conference. My name is Adam Lowensteiner, Vice President of Lithum Partners. During this session, we welcome Echo Brands Corporation, ticker symbol is ACCO, that is Alpha Charlie Charlie Oscar, on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, and its chairman, CEO Boris Ellisman. Uh, before we begin, those not familiar with Lithum Partners, it's one of the country's leading investor relations firms. With more than two decades of corporate access experience, we have built one of the industry's most diverse and effective platforms for connecting small cap companies with high quality and focused institutional investors while creating a framework of best practices in all aspects of investor relations. Today's discussion is hopefully yet another example where we could bring value to multiple constituents. We'll proceed in a moment. But one final item, I want to remind everyone that ACO Brands is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings later this week. If you have not already signed up, please send me an email at lowensteiner at, Lithum, at lithumpartners.com or visit www.lithumpartners.com forward slash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. So with that said, let's begin. Boris, thanks for joining us. Why don't you give us a little bit of background on yourself and then a little brief overview on the company? Uh, sure, Adam. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, glad to join you and, and speak with uh, Lithum's uh, clients today. Uh, I've been with the company since 2004, uh, so a long time, and been the uh, CEO since 2013. Uh, prior to joining Echo Brands in 2004, I spent 15 years at Hewlett Packard in uh, various, uh, various roles. Uh, Echo Brands is a company that designs markets and manufactures well-recognized consumer and, uh, and user brands used in uh, homes, schools, and businesses. The company has been around for over 100 years, roughly $2 billion in revenues, $1.41 in adjusted EPS last year, with 22% um, top-line growth and 5% uh, organic growth. We sell our products in over 100 countries, and we are uh, a leader in the categories where we compete. Great. Please tell us about your upcoming back to school season in the United States. What, what do you expect? What is like the um, channel inventory situation for this year? We expect the uh, North American back to school season to be strong this year. It was strong last year, uh, recovering uh, after COVID, but the sellout, which was strong, did not match the sell-in, which was more muted because there was extra inventory in the channel from uh, 2020. We exited 2021 back to school with very clean inventory uh, and we expect the sell-in to match the sell-out. So as a result, we expect uh, for us to have a, a strong back to school season in North America. So with COVID um, kind of behind us, after a couple of years of office closures, it appears that Many now are reopening, um, some offering hybrid opportunities to employees. How does that impact your, your business overall? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, people are coming back to the offices. Uh, many are coming back in a hybrid mode where they work in the office a couple of days a week and they work from home uh, a couple of days a week. We, we do think that that's going to be the way uh, people work in the future. Now, typically, when people are coming back to the offices, that is a tailwind for our business. Uh, we expect uh, more demand for office uh, supplies as a result, while people are still buying necessary products for their home offices as well. So um, we saw uh, a recovery in our commercial business in all of uh, 2021, and we expect that to continue in 22 as more and more people go back to the offices. So your global operations, and uh, maybe go into that a little bit, but the question is, you know, wh why has EMEA been able to outperform for the past year and a half? Yes, we are a global company. 46% of our sales are in the United States, 33% in Europe, and then the uh, remaining 21% in, in the rest of the world. Uh, EMEA, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa, um, has done a phenomenal job over the last two years, growing organically 15% last year uh, and exceeding to, uh, 2019 revenues, uh, which is obviously pre-COVID. Uh, we have a uh, large business with well-recognized brands 
We have a significant footprint in continental Europe, especially in larger countries such as Germany, France, uh, Italy, UK, and Spain. We have 100 plus feet on the street salespeople selling our products in Europe, which is a big competitive advantage uh, versus most other global companies that sell through primarily through distribution um, and not through their local sales forces. So as a result, and, and a result of a great team, tremendous product offering and broad coverage, we were able to grow substantially and take significant market share um, over the last couple of years. When, when things are tough, uh, both uh, resellers and consumers tend to go with the brands they know and they trust. And as a result, we were able to consolidate the market around us. Inflation is a big topic these days. What are you, what are you seeing in, with respect to inflation and um, what are you doing to combat it? Uh, inflation is a, is a big issue. Uh, it, it has been for the last uh, three quarters and certainly is continuing into 2022. Um, we're not really seeing a reduction in the inflationary uh, uh, pressures. You know, there's really one way to combat inflation and, and that's to raise prices to offset the cost increases. And that's what we've been doing uh, all of last year. We had four price increases in the US last year. Uh, we're gonna do some more this year because we still have not uh, caught up uh, given where inflation is at now. Uh, we had um, price increases in our international segment, uh, one in Europe. We're doing two more in Europe and one international. So we're, we're um, raising prices to offset the impact of inflation. The good news, uh, Adam, is that the consumer so far uh, has shown to be receptive to higher prices. Uh, they understand that costs are going up. Uh, there's more money in their pockets as a result of both wage increases and also government programs over the last couple of years to put more money in consumers' pockets. So uh, they have been uh, accepting higher prices. I'm assuming also your competitors are doing the same uh, price increases as well? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. These costs are affecting everybody, uh, both our competitors and our customers have been raising prices uh, to try to uh, stay in tune with what's happening with costs. Okay. <clears throat> are you seeing these costs increase in line with the inflation rates? Um, you know, it, it, it depends on the category and commodity. Um, things that are more dependent on oil, um, which is both transportation uh, and certain commodities have seen higher cost increases than the average. If, if, you know, if you look at the US average of 6.97%, um, uh, certainly oil-based products uh, have seen a higher cost increase. And, and logistically speaking, are you need, is it required to um, prepare a little bit earlier um, given the higher oil prices and, and, the, and, the, and the supply chain issues um, to prepare for your seasonally um, uh, higher revenue industries, uh, um, higher um, seasonally um, driven times of the year, I guess? Yeah, no, that, that's a good, good, good question. And the answer is yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, given um, supply chain issues uh, and expectations for continued challenges in supply chain, uh, we have to uh, ship the products uh, in time for uh, back to school season, for example, uh, a month earlier than we typically do. So yes, we do have to work earlier this year than, than we typically do. Um, maybe have maybe share with investors a little bit so um, we get a little bit more color on, on this subject is what, what types of raw materials you use and, and do you hedge any of these inputs? Uh, the raw materials that go into our products are, are typically uh, paper, corrugate, steel, plastic. Uh, those are probably you know, 80% of uh, commodities that we use. We don't hedge raw materials per se, but we do hedge uh, purchases of inventory. So we, you know, we do an inventory forecast uh, by region and uh, we hedge uh, uh, foreign currency translation to US dollars. Uh, at the time that we make the uh, inventory purchase. And primarily, where, where are your products produced? 40% uh, of our products are produced locally in the countries where we sell. 
uh, about a third of our products are made in China. And then the remaining, call it 25%, is in other uh, low cost countries such as Vietnam, um, Taiwan, some Eastern European countries, um, et cetera. Um, let's pivot a little bit here. Um, you made an acquisition uh, about, of Power A. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about that. And um, is it meeting your expectations, what it's all about, what you're looking to accomplish with, with this acquisition? Yes, uh, we acquired Power A at the end of uh, 2020. Uh, Power A is a company that makes accessories for uh, video gaming consoles. They make controllers, uh, power charges, and headsets uh, for video to play video games. Um, Power A, a year, almost a year and a half into the acquisition, uh, was an incredible acquisition for us. Uh, it met and exceeded all of our expectations. Um, when we bought it, um, they had $210 million of revenue. Uh, we finished last year with $257 million of revenue. So we had 23% growth, which is significantly higher than we expected. Uh, and it's a very profitable business. Uh, we were able to leverage our cost structure. So all of the uh, variable profit really drops to the bottom line. So we're incredibly happy with the acquisition. They're a market leader uh, in third-party accessories, both in the US uh, and the UK. And our plans are to continue to grow the business and to leverage the Apple brand's footprint to accelerate the growth, especially in Europe and uh, international markets. Can you discuss a little bit about the thinking behind the acquisition and, and folding that into some of the other brands um, uh, and what maybe some synergies might be? Uh, sure. We've been a, on a strategic journey to transform our portfolio from more office products legacy uh, business, North America centric business, to faster growing, uh, um, higher margin uh, categories. And we've been on this journey for the last uh, few years. We've always looked at um, adjacencies uh, to help accelerate the growth, but just didn't couldn't find something that met both our strategic objective as well as made sense financially. Uh, Power A was one of those rare finds where all the stars aligned and uh, it was attractive both strategically and, and uh, we got lucky in striking a financial de deal with the sellers that made sense for both parties. Um, so this journey we've been on, it's been on for a while. Uh, Power A is really the first uh, adjacent opportunity that we were able to act on, not because we haven't tried, but just because we haven't found something uh, that uh, met all of our objectives. Uh, there are a lot of commonalities between Power A and uh, our Kensington business and also our school business. So we're very familiar with the business model that they uh, engage in. And again, we're very happy with that, uh, with that acquisition. You mentioned um, Kensington. Maybe give us a little description about that business and what's going on there. Sure. Uh, Kensington is a computer accessory business. We make accessories for primarily laptops, but also for desktop PCs and uh, uh, Macs and uh, um, iPads, for example. We've had that business for many, many years. Uh, Kensington just celebrated their 40th birthday. So its business has been around uh, uh, for a while. Um, it's been a very successful business uh, for ACO. Uh, Kensington is approximately 10% uh, of its sales and a higher percentage of the overall profits uh, because it is a profitable business. Um, they've done really well last year um, and, and the year before, and we expect them to grow at 10% plus in the uh, uh, coming future. Now, Power A probably has some seasonality around the holiday season. Is that fair to say? And does Kensington have any seasonality or is that kind of year-round smooth type of uh, production? Yeah, that's a good observation, Adam. Power A is a very seasonal business. Uh, about uh, a third of Power A's business is in the first half of the year and about two-thirds in the second half of the year. 
with most of the sales coming uh, in uh, in Q4. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it certainly uh, has a seasonality of typical kind of holiday gifting uh, products. Uh, Kensington is much more stable. There is a little bit more in the second half than the first half, but I'd say it's probably 45-55 H1 split rather than this one third, two thirds that we see in Power A. So, so the obvious question, I guess, you know, with regards to Kings, Kensington and, and Power A, you know, can you comment a little bit about, about the chip shortage? Are you seeing any shortages? How are you um, reacting to that, if so? Uh, good question. Yes, we have seen um, uh, chip shortages um, affect all of, our, all of our products that have any kind of uh, semiconductor content. Um, you know, it, it, it affects... If you look at the effect on, on our uh, product availability specifically, it has more effect right now on Kensington than Powray because with Powray, we were able to buy some of these proprietary chips uh, in advance. So with extra inventory to protect us uh, against chip shortages uh, with Kensington's a little bit, a little bit hand to mouth. Uh, so we've, we've had uh, uh, some delays associated with the Kensington uh, supply chain. Um, we're talking to our partners and um, um, knowing the industry, uh, we expect uh, chip shortages to still be here uh, for most of 2022. Uh, the situation should get better by the uh, end of this year, uh, but we're, we're likely still going to have to live with this uh, uh, for a while. For Power A, even though we have enough inventory uh, in our products, they've been affected by chip shortages with the video gaming consoles. So, you know, if you, if you play video games, you know it's been difficult to get either an Xbox or a PlayStation 5. Um, and, um, you know, that, that does affect uh, Power A sales. Yeah, I've heard they're sold out uh, very quickly. As soon as they get them in, they're, they're, they're off the shelf. They're not even on the shelves. Exactly, they're gone. They're, you know, these uh, automatic bots running around hunting for any available inventory and reselling it on eBay as quickly as they can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you are a brand's company. You have a lot of things going on. You mentioned before a little bit about how, you know, Power A and um, w- what's the M&A ar- arena look like? What's your criteria? What, what, you know, what are you, what, what is ACO looking for? And, and maybe even also share like, are, are there, you know, valuation bands that you look at or, um, you know, are you willing to pay up for something depending upon what it is? Maybe, maybe add a little color around that as well. Uh, sure. Uh, we, we are pretty active in um, the acquisition um, front. Uh, we look a lot. We were acquiring roughly uh, one company uh, per year. Uh, we feel that we're in a situation right now where uh, we can be a little bit more choosy. Uh, in, in our acquisitions, uh, we believe that we can grow organically at 2 to 4% per year without doing uh, any acquisitions. Um, we'd like to do some if we can find something that meets uh, both strategic and financial criteria. And if you look at those, strategically, we want strong brands. We want uh, market share uh, leadership. We want diversified channels or growing channels. Uh, and we want some some level of dif- differentiation, sustainable differentiation. And then on the financial end, uh, you know, obviously we want um, accretive uh, gross margins, uh, 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 accretive cash flow, and accretive uh, EPS, uh, as well as, uh, you know, higher than average uh, uh, growth rates. Uh, if you look at historically uh, the multiples at, at which we acquired, uh, until Power A, we were acquiring um, companies at roughly six times uh, pre-synergies um, and uh, roughly four times uh, uh, both synergies, which you know is very very creative uh, for for our shareholders. Uh, with Power A, because of the growth growth profile of our business, we made that acquisition depending on on, on how you count. Uh, at roughly uh, eight to nine times uh, EV to EBITDA. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we that acquisition has been a, uh, you know, a very accretive for, for our shareholders. So 
if we can find something uh, that attractive, we certainly would be willing uh, to pay up. But we also, you know, we look at um, return on invested capital as a metric for evaluating acquisitions. And if we feel that um, we can't get a return on invested capital that's higher than our weighted average cost of capital, then we won't do an acquisition. So we actually walked away from some acquisitions that just been too pricey, even though it's been a nice strategic fit, uh, just been too pricey for our shareholders. How do you source the, these um, acquisitions? Do you have a funnel of, of, of you know, do you have a, 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 a criteria or um, um, a well that you go to or, or, or a division that, that's on top of this? Or maybe, maybe you add a little bit of color how you, your process of, of finding um, acquisitions. Yeah, you know, we've been at this game for a long time and we've been uh, pursuing the strategy for a long time. So um, both companies and uh, banks know that we're interested in uh, companies that are coming up for sale. So we are aware of most, if not all, opportunities kind of around our product space that are, uh, that are available. And we get that information both from principals themselves uh, as well as from investment banks that they hire uh, to pursue a strategic tra tra transaction. We have a small team, small dedicated team in the company uh, that is involved in uh, uh, corporate development. Uh, and then obviously if we you know, decide something that we like, then we have a much broader team that's involved in due diligence and final decision-making. And, um... What, what's your bandwidth like with regards to acquisitions? How's, how's your balance sheet look or, and, and what capabilities do you have to, to, to do acquisitions? Um, right now, we're still uh, uh, paying off debt uh, associated with the Power A acquisition. Uh, we uh, bought all of that with you know, cash and debt. Um, we finished last year at a net debt to EBITDA ratio of 3.3. Uh, so we've delivered quite nicely. Uh, we, we plan to be below three this year. Um, I feel that by the end of this year, or certainly in the second half of this year, we will have capacity um, to do additional acquisitions. We have uh, close to $600 million on a revolver. So we can certainly uh, do it if we wanted to. Um, um, but, you know, as I mentioned, um, given where we are, uh, given the increased uh, risks of uh, recession and geopolitical risks, just the bar for acquisitions is, is higher than it was. Yeah, my next question was gonna be if the Fed is gonna get involved here and they say they're gonna get involved aggressively, um, I would assume every quarter of a point that, that goes up that changes the metrics of potential acquisitions. Yeah, I mean, obviously the cost of borrowing will, will go up and given that we're using uh, debt uh, to fund acquisitions, uh, yeah, acquisitions will become more expensive and uh, uh, that means uh, fewer of them will get done, which I think is Fed's intention, right? I, I mean, on, on, that, on that front, are, are you, you know, willing to divest any businesses or product lines? You know, we, we, we're a public company, so uh, we're willing, to, we're willing to, do, to do whatever is necessary at the right price. Um, we've had... Uh, a few inbound requests for, for some of our businesses over, over time, uh, but nothing that made any sense for our shareholders. So certainly if there is, uh, you know, we're not looking uh, to sell, but if there's a, a, something that makes uh, sense for our shareholders, we will take a look at it and act appropriately in the interest of our shareholders. So you expect to generate around 165 million of free cash flow this year. Um, how do, you, how do you plan on using it? Uh, most of that will still go towards uh, paid up, paying down debt. As I mentioned, we want to be below three uh, net debt to EBITDA ratio by the end of the year. Uh, we have a dividend that we fund that takes about $30 million of uh, free cash flow. Uh, and then and, you know, the rest, whatever's left, we'll use uh, uh, either for share repurchases or if we do an acquisition, we'll, do, we'll use it for that or we'll use it to uh, uh, pay down even more debt. So we're gonna be opportunistic with, uh, with share repurchases. If, uh, uh, certainly if the price is uh, where it's at, we're likely to do share repurchases this year. Um, 
we're running up against the end of our time here, but I'd like to pass it off to you. If there's anything else that we didn't cover or anything else you'd like to share with us before we end the discussion bars. Yeah, I just wanted to reemphasize, you know, some of some of uh, the viewers here um, have probably heard of Aco Brands or new Aco Brands, uh, given that we've been around for so many years. Uh, it's a very different company today uh, than um, uh, you may have known uh, in your past. Um, the company is much more uh, consumer and technology oriented than it used to be. Over sixty uh, percent of our sales. Uh, consumer and uh, technology products. Only 40% of our sales are commercial and office products. The company has a very different organic growth profile than it uh, has historically. Um, and uh, it's a lot less dependent on some of the uh, more troubled legacy channels than it used to be. So I would encourage, the company's always been profitable. The company's always been well-managed. Uh, the concern from investors has always been organic growth. Uh, and given what we've done over the last few years on that front, uh, I would encourage your uh, uh, viewers or our viewers to take a second look, second look at Echo Brands. Great, Boris. Thank, thank you very much for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Adam. Anyone, to anyone that has not already signed up for a one-on-one -on -one with Echo, please, again, send me an email, lowensteiner at lithumpartners.com, or again, visit www.lithumpartners.com forward slash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. We hope you all enjoy the conference and have a great day. Thank you.